In the previous lessons, you've learned about various resume formats. In this lesson, you'll learn about electronic and scannable resumes used for internet recruiting and resume screening. You'll also learn about internal resumes, which are especially important when you're seeking promotion within your existing organization. Whether you're preparing a resume for posting online or sending in an email or preparing a resume for an optical scanner, you always follow good resume writing practice. That means using keywords for specific skills and requirements from the job description. That means making sure to use key competencies in your summary and listing key competencies early in the resume. That means using the language strategies you've learned for writing strong accomplishment statements. That means spell checking and carefully proofreading the copy to eliminate mistakes. And that means choosing a design to match your marketing purpose. The design can be a functional, chronological, direct competency, or a combination format. So let's look now at electronic resumes. These include any resume that's created for posting online or submitting via email. Most large organizations and national recruiting firms no longer accept resumes as email attachments. The risk of downloading a virus is just too great. In many organizations, employees are forbidden from opening any email. attachments. Now one of the ways you can overcome this constraint is by sending potential employers a link to a web page on which your resume is posted. It might be posted as a PDF file or you might post it on your own website. Then you can present the resume in an attractive visual layout much as it might appear in a nicely printed hard copy version. Even if you do this, you will still likely want to have a plain text version of any resume you prepare. You use plain text for the cut and paste resume submission systems that many organizations have on their websites. A plain text format is also free of viruses and can be pasted directly into the body of an email, not included as an attachment. That's a format that many smaller businesses prefer. And the plain text format, typically ASCII, is compatible with virtually every word processor and email system in the world. This format will preserve document structure when viewed in Courier or another monospaced font. By the way, Courier was nearly released with the name Messenger, but then the font designer chose the name Courier to denote special speed and a secure means of transmitting a message from point A to point B. It brings to mind a courier service like UPS, DHL, or FedEx. To create a plain text file in most word processing programs, you simply save a copy of the resume as text only. Use a monospaced font like Courier. Use a regular font style, so no boldface or italics. Make sure you save the text with a maximum line width of 70 characters to ensure a consistent layout with any email client. There will be no formatting mechanism within a plain text document, ensuring that the text will not be platform or application specific. That also means special characters, such as smart quotes or mathematical symbols, should be avoided. Do not use tabs, instead use the space bar. Since you're using a monospaced font, the spacing will be consistent from platform to platform. The default alignment is left justified, so use spaces if you want to indent a sentence or center a heading. Finally, do not use word wrap when composing a plain text resume. Instead, use hard carriage returns to insert line breaks.
Make sure you save the text with a maximum line width of 70 characters to ensure a consistent layout with any email client. There will be no formatting mechanism within a plain text document, ensuring that the text will not be platform or application specific. That also means special characters, such as smart quotes or mathematical symbols, should be avoided. Do not use tabs. Instead, use the space bar. Since you're using a monospaced font, the spacing will be consistent from platform to platform. The default alignment is left justified, so use spaces if you want to indent a sentence or center a heading. Finally, do not use word wrap when composing a plain text resume. Instead, use hard carriage returns to insert line breaks. So let's look next at preparing a scannable resume. This is a resume that can be read by an optical scanner. These scanners use optical character recognition software, or OCR for short. And if you're planning to submit to an organization that uses an OCR engine in its applicant tracking system, you'll want to prepare a scannable version of your resume. To find out if you need to provide a scannable version, you can always contact the organization's Human Resources Department and ask. A resume prepared for optical scanning will use a common non-decorative sans-serif font, such as Arial or Optima, in a font size from 10 to 14 point. You might use an OCR font. You can ask for recommendations from the HR department. Serif fonts, like Times or Palatino or even Courier, can produce visual noise in some OCR packages, so these are to be avoided. In any strings that use slashes, for example, TCP slash IP, add a space between the slashes so that the slash does not touch the letters. Submit laser printed original copy on crisp white paper of brightness at least 92. Never submit dot matrix printer copy. Use the standard paper size for the organization you're submitting to. For example, 8.5 by 11 inch in North America, A4 in Europe. Prepare single spaced, single sided copy. Avoid two column format. Remember scanners read from left to right. Don't use vertical or horizontal lines. Your resume can be more than one page if necessary but do not fold or staple pages together. If you have more than one page, paperclip the pages together. Mail in a 9 by 12 inch envelope or whatever format is right for your area. Use uppercase type for section headings. Place your name at the top of each page on its own line. Do not use italics, underlining, graphics, shading, or boldface. That's it for the electronic and scannable resumes. We'll close this lesson with a brief comment about internal resumes. Remember, a resume is a marketing document. As such, it can be a valuable tool to help you get promoted. Many employees do not think of using a resume internally, yet this is a very effective way of documenting skills and progressive growth that your manager or your manager's manager may not be aware of. For these resumes, the use of scannable keywords or concise objectives is not so important. The main point is showing measurable successes that are relevant to your current employer. Examples include increase in sales, return on investment, and the like. An excellent time to present an updated resume is when you have your annual performance review. 
If you've taken the time to provide quantitative proof of a successful year, you're in a much better position to ask for a promotion or a salary increase or a bonus. This practice would be especially effective if you've been following the strategy we talked about in the first course, namely submitting monthly accomplishment status reports to your immediate superior. You'd be surprised at how many regular employees in the be surprised at how many regular employees in the same job for course, namely submitting monthly accomplishment status reports to your immediate superior. You'd be surprised at how many regular employees in the same job for several years will have never thought about doing this. They will never realize the benefits it could bring them. Why don't you try it and enjoy the benefits it could bring you? Now that you know what to put on a resume to make a hit with employers, I'm going to tell you what you should leave off the resume. Six elements that will doom it to failure. Even if you're responding to an ad that specifically asked for this information, don't include it. If your expectations or salary history are too high, a prospective employer will weed you out right from the start. If they're too low, you've lost your bargaining power, or worse, you'll be hired for possibly thousands less than what you're worth. It's a no-win situation. Remember, it's always best to discuss salary requirements after an offer has been made. Personal data. It's a waste of prime resume real estate. No employer will make the interview call based on your age, marital status, or excellent health. If your excellent health is directly related to the position you're seeking, maybe a warehouse job where you have to lift heavy objects, the time to bring that up is in the interview. We might like to think that there are enough legal protections against discrimination that disclosing personal information such as age and marital status would not be an issue, but unfortunately we would just be fooling ourselves. The only time that including hobbies or personal interests on a resume is a good idea is when your interests are relevant to the position for which you're applying. For the most part, you can cover this in the actual interview. These never count in your favor. If you left a job involuntarily, that's a strike against you. Laid off always sounds a bit like fired to some employers. If you left voluntarily, that's also a strike against you. Maybe the employer thinks mm, he won't stick with this job either. The best strategy is to never raise the issue. In some organizations, putting your picture on a resume eliminates it automatically. These organizations want to avoid exposure to possible discrimination complaints. Discrimination protections notwithstanding, Pictures simply give employers another reason to reject your resume. If they don't like your looks, if they think you look too young, too old, too fat, too thin, too good looking, not good looking enough, or whatever, your resume.